the net proceeds from tonight will benefit Meeting House Arts, which is the organization that brings you this wonderful venue and the gallery next door, and as well as a bunch of uh, wonderful arts programming in our communities. We have two events left in our season. On October 10th, we're gonna take on the serious subject of the referendum on public versus private ownership of the power company here in Maine. We're gonna have Joe Cohen, who's a partner at Verald Dana, and Al Cleveland, who's the campaign manager for Yes on Question 3, Pine Tree Power. This is gonna be a free ticketed event for the community, and it's right here in Meeting House Arts. And rounding out the season, we're really, really happy to bring back on our stage here on November 16th, Dr. Nirav Shah, who's coming from the CDC in Atlanta, to talk to us about uh, the effect of climate change on global public health. We're going to have ticket costs and availability up on our website, freeportspeech.org, very soon. And we also have going up very soon the video recording of our last event last month, which was three former Maine college presidents talking about the recent Supreme Court decision on affirmative action in uh, college admissions. As always, I want to thank our season supporters. They're listed on our website and on our program, I believe. We can't do this without you. There are some books, thanks to Sherman's, our local bookseller. We have books of each of our authors tonight available uh, for purchase in the back of the room, and we're going to have a signing in the gallery. Oh, they're over in the gallery now, I'm being told, by the peanut gallery here. They're, they're, they're over in the gallery available for purchase and signing by the authors at the end of the evening. There, free, we have Freeport Speech believe in open and, and constructive speech. There's been some speech lately in Freeport that hasn't been that. And I think many of you are aware there's been some events of hate speech, graffiti, and, and other actions here. Um, we wanted to let you know that the town of Freeport is holding a uh, public meeting on Friday at the town hall at 4 p.m. to talk about their continuing response to that, those, that situation, those events. Okay, on to the authors. We're lucky tonight to not just have two authors on our stage, but as you're gonna see very soon, two friends who have encouraged and supported each other as they pursued their art. Introducing the authors this evening is Liza Bakewell. She's not just an accomplished anthropologist, professor, author, and adventurer, but she's a dear friend of mine who has shared her creativity and imagination with me as we raised our children in this community over the last 20 years. So please welcome Liza Bel Bakewell, Lily King, and Susan Connolly. Okay. Wow, the lights. <laughs> it's such an honor for me to uh, present to you these two pillars, these two giants <laughs> of Maine's writing community, Lily King and Susan Connolly. Back in 1997, almost 30 years ago, okay, 26 years ago, Lily and Susan made a pact with each other that in three years they would both be living in Maine. <laughs> Did I get that right? <laughs> and true to each other's wishes, that's exactly what happened. Not that either was an outsider to begin with. Lily had summer here as at points in her young life, and Susan as a child grew up here. By the time they made this pact with one another, they were already writers committed to the writing life. Writing has occupied their lives, all their lives. When Lily was eight years old and in third grade, she read, guess who, Judy Bloom, and was struck by the realism and honesty that she saw in those books. They catalyzed her desire to be a storyteller too. A BA in creative writing from UNC Chapel Hill and later an MA from Syracuse followed eventually. 
She had to finish third grade. And then, after grad school, she took a job as a high school English teacher in Valencia, España, and began writing her first novel. And as she put it, eight years, 10 more moves all over the US, and many bookstore, restaurant, and teaching jobs later, that novel was published as The Pleasing Hour in 1999. Lily's many moves had advantages. I love languages, Lily told me yesterday. Learning a second, third, and fourth language, French, Italian, and Spanish, in addition to English, of course, introduced the realization that any single language can be confining. Different languages can open up new ways of describing experiences, therefore amplifying her own. For Susan, poetry was where she started out loving writing and language. Formerly, she studied poetry at Middlebury, where she earned her BA, and more intensely at San Diego State University, where she earned her MA in poetry. She turned to full-length books when she found herself living with her husband and two small children in China for three years and wanting to tell the story of life there, which had its wonders as well as its ups and downs, so that a longer narrative than poetry offered seemed in order. Quote, I like to examine change in people's lives, adversity, betrayal, difficulties that require some kind of reckoning, Susan told me yesterday over the phone. So what followed these two authors' beginnings are books and books and more books. Here's how I see them. I fell in love with Susan's China memoir, A Foremost Good Fortune, only to fall in love even more with her next book, Paris Was the Place, which was followed by Stop Here, This Is the Place, Elsie Come Home, and now Landslide, which is now my favorite Susan Connolly book. This has been true for me with Lily's books, The Pleasing Hour, The English Teacher, Father of the Rain, Euphoria, and Writers and Lovers, exclaiming each time I finish, oh, this one is my favorite, only to say the same of the next one, so that her most recent, a collection of short stories titled Five Tuesdays in Winter, is now absolutely my favorite. I feel a bit like Picasso, not as an artist, but as a reader. When he answered after having been asked, what is your favorite painting in all his oeuvre? His famous response was, my next one. So what is my favorite book by Lily and Susan? Their most recent one, but in a few years, it will be their next one. <laughs> Bodies of genius that just get better and better. Setting my accolades aside, listen to some of the national ones. Susan's Landslide was named a New York Times Editor Choice, a Today Show Best Summer Read, a Vanity Fair book we can't stop thinking about, and a New York Times Paperback Row Best Paperback Pick. It was also named a Best Book by Good Morning America, The New York Post, and many others and it was chosen as main NPR's All Books Considered Book Club pick. And Lily's most recent book, Writers and Lovers, was named New York Times 100 Notable Books of 2020, Washington Post 10 Best Books of 2020, NPR's Fresh Air, Maureen Corrigan's Top 10 Books, NPR Best Books of 2020, People Magazine Top 10 Books, Los Angeles Times, 10 Best Books, Amazon, Best Literature and Fiction, Kirkus Reviews, Best Fiction Books of 2020. Each one of their books, by the way, have this long list of accolades. And if you want some fun reading, uh, if not daunting reading, go to their websites. And there'll be links also to some of the reviews. While very different styles, the two authors are par excellence good storytellers. And this is the essence of writing, isn't it? To tell a good story and to tell it well. And when it's done well, it's done with honesty. That although, for the most part, fiction feels very, very real. And in a sense, it is real. Because they're tapping into human truths. 
Of course, I could go on and on. I haven't even mentioned their teaching, mentoring, and founding of the telling room. I haven't mentioned the prisoners whose lives have changed from Susan's teaching there, the workshops they have run. It's all very important work serving our community of writers here in Maine, young and old, aspiring and accomplished. And in the process, they've contributed enormously to our Maine community of writers and readers. I'm going to close with a quick anecdote, and it concerns an exhibit that um, I did with uh, Carrie Michaels, who's here in the audience, photographer, writer, published author from Freeport. And it was an exhibit that was a collection of quotes by Maine women writers. We chose, we were invited by the University of New England Art Gallery here in Portland to exhibit 50 of the quotes from a book we had edited of 100 quotes. And so we framed, we letterpress printed a quote, then we uh, enlarged one of Carrie's photographs and then framed the two together. And we had 50 of these. And as we were trying to figure out where to put them in this large gallery space, I had put Sus the quote by Susan and Lily together uh, in the first room, but I thought the power of their quotes might be better served by distributing them separately in different rooms. But as I walked around with Susan's quote, trying to find another place, it never really fit in. It just seemed to want to be next to Lily's. And so I, at the um, opening in January of 2015, I mentioned this to Lily, and she said to me, the quote from Susan, which came from a poem Susan had written, was in fact a poem written for Lily's wedding. <laughs> yes. So I, I guess I never told you. <laughs> I never Sorry. told me. Um, so to me, that's not just an illustration of the power of language, which both of them will address and, of course, do in their writing. But it's also about the mysteries found in language's power. So now, of course, it's time to turn the floor over to our two wonderful speakers, to the radical acts of reading and writing, which our guests have so kindly agreed to discuss with us. Please welcome Lily King and Susan Connolly. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liza. That was really, really lovely. Um, and thank you, Kathy, and thank you, everyone involved in Meeting House Arts. This is really such an honor for, for both of us, I think. And, um, and it's so great to, we're so Portland-focused, you know, so it's really great to come up to Freeport and <laughs> see new people, new faces. I haven't there's actually people out there that I haven't seen before, which is very exciting. It's a stunning, stunning place. I know, it really is. I'm just so excited to be here. The acoustics seem really good, too. Wow. Um, well, we have been reading and writing together for a very long time. We actually met in Boston when um, we were both before, before children. And we were asked by a friend of ours to be a part of her, like start a book club with her. And I thought that I was, a, I was starting the book club with our friend Electa, and Susan thought she was starting the book club with Electa. So it was very funny. Years later, we found out that actually we were each kind of co-founders of the book club, and uh, we'd been kind of bamboozled. But um, <laughs> we became fast friends, and, uh, and then we did indeed make a pact to move to Maine because we were both yearning to move to Maine. And then we started a writer's group together, and, and here we are. Here we are. So I thought I would start it out by um, just starting with the kind of with the intersection between re reading and writing. And um, I think reading is one thing when you're a reader, mm. and reading is another thing when you're writing a novel. You know, reading takes on, there are some writers who say, I cannot read fiction when I'm writing fiction. And I need fiction desperately, but I become, I'm voraciously hungry to read 
when I'm, when I'm writing a novel, but also just an incredibly picky eater. Like I, I, nothing satisfies, everything is not right, and I'm, I'm looking for a particular thing and I don't even know what it, was, what it is. And I'm wondering if you have that, that same kind of strange relationship with reading and with books when you're writing a novel? Mm, mm. It's a rhetorical question. <laughs> she, she knows no. the answer. Um, uh, that's just the beauty of getting to talk together for all these <laughs> decades. Um, yes, yes, I do. And, um, you know, this word keeps coming up um, for me, which is, a tone, is tone, tonal quality. Um, I, I've, I've shifted to the word vibe, too, which is very, you know, <laughs> 1970s. But a book could have a vibe. It could have a tonal quality. And I'm looking for that when I'm reading as a writer. And we were very aware of the title of tonight's talk, you know, the radical act of writing and reading. And, you know, we won't pay too much attention to that title. And yet it kind of echoed in my head when I was thinking of questions for you and thinking of things to talk about. and kind of really just honoring that, in fact, it is radical at times to pay attention and read and write and get really quiet and pay, pay really close attention. Um, so it's tonal for me. Um, yeah. Can you, can you yes. elaborate about yeah. what do you mean by tonal and can you give, and what kind of Tone mm. are you searching for? Mm. And, it, and it must vary from book to book. Right. So I'm, um, what one might need if one were, perhaps, in their next novel, writing a um, road trip novel set in France with two very, very close friends, one of whom has committed a small act of betrayal, one might want some eviscerating dialogue and sort of very high stakes set in a foreign country. So. What if I didn't get my hands on The Marriage Portrait by Maggie O'Farrell last spring? And I don't think I could stop talking about that book. I, it's set in Italy in the 1550s, and it just fed everything so I needed a novel to do. And it had nothing to do with a novel set in France in 2023 between two friends, and yet it had everything. So it was, it's, it's extremely tight dialogue, and then it's just enormous sensory pleasure, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, and tone, like you could tell that Maggie O'Farrell had such delight at times writing it, mm, right? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, you recommended it to me and I'm writing a different novel, needing a different tone, and I was like, you know, <laughs> perfectly good book, not what I need. Right. Like, not working for me. No. It's very, very funny. And so, and that's like that. Reading is like that for everyone. Like, you know, you can pick up a book, you know, at age 26, and be like, I cannot, cannot get through this. And then, you know, five years later or something, you pick it up and you're like, this is what I need. You know, this is giving me oxygen. And, and, it, and it's so interesting how that is. So interesting. I mean, it, and I think it happens to all, I'm sure it happens to all of us. I think I let Cersei sit on my bed stand mm. for like five years, five years. And, and then one day I was like, oh, I'll give it another try. And then I thought it was the most brilliant book yeah. ever. Um, so yeah, um, now, now I have a little something for you. Okay. All right. Did you? I okay. Yeah. Did I finish? No, no. <laughs> no, it's good. You, you go ahead. Or should I just put it right back to you? Well, I did. Let me put it back to you. I did happen to bring <laughs> my very favorite book that just fed me. <laughs> so I brought a little, you know, show and tell. But this is Kairos by Jenny Erpenbeck. Has anyone read it yet? It just came out in May. No one. Okay, you have to go buy this immediately. Um, and again. It fed me, and I don't know if it would feed you. Uh, it is set in Europe. Um, and I don't know why, because I'm writing a book that is set, the first part is set in kind of the south in 1988, maybe. And then the second part is again in the south in, in maybe the late teens of the 21st century. And so very American. Um, and this is East Germany, 1986 continuing on through the falling of the wall and it's about a, a 19 year old woman falling in love with a man and a writer in his 50s and it is I just was kind of electrified not by the love affair which is 
intense and interesting and disturbing, but by the way the state um, kind of pressed on the relationship, but very in, in kind of pulses, like, you know, and, and, and the way this 19-year-old had never known anything else, but, but kind of as, you know, part of the Soviet bloc. And, and yet it was such a loving portrait of that world, which you never see in kind of dissident novels. And, and, and the state just was weaving kind of more and more heavily into their lives, and the relationship was starting to look like the state. And, um, and it, it's told in, in kind of an interesting structure going back and forth between the two of them in the third person. Anyway, I have no idea why it would have fed me in my novel, which is first person, often present tense, not very political, but it was like, I think for me, it, was, it told me writing can be, can feel so incredibly, like a, fic, a, a novel, fiction can feel so incredibly important and vital and, and, and tell a story in a way that no other form can tell. And it was just, it was just so reassuring just in terms of, of this profession that we have, you know? And, and, and sometimes, you know, you kind of can lose faith in it a little bit and you meet people every day who say that they stopped reading fiction 10 years ago or 20 years ago or something. Even my beloved English teacher told me a few years ago that he'd stopped reading fiction. <laughs> So, you know, I, I don't know. It just was very renewing for me, and um, so I had to just recommend it to you all. Well, I'm really glad you did. I have a friend in the audience. I'm not sure where he is, but we were talking just two nights ago, I think, about the great mystery that is reading and this sort of giving of the mystery from the writer to the reader, that there's something very mysterious that happens when we're writing, and we're going to talk about that a bit um, tonight, I hope sort of how you conjure a scene and a, the plot is kind of not at all clear a lot of the time, but there's this mystery, mystery, mysterious creative thing happening. There's a conjuring happening. And then when you can connect to the reader, like that book connected to you, then, you, then we don't know why. We don't know why that worked for you, but it was a mystery and it, it's very exciting. Yeah. It's very exciting, it's very radical. <laughs> I won't do it that Susan, much, but... Susan is the assigned I'm, person who's going to be seeing the word radical every I, now and then. I like the word a lot. I, wrote, <laughs> I, I did spend some time writing about teenage boys, and like, they use the word radical sometimes. <laughs> I use it with irony. Um, okay, so just staying in literature for a minute, I, I did devour more of Virginia Woolf's diaries this summer. Mm. They're, for a writer, they're, they're mana, because she just is struggling with everything that we, anyone who's an artist in this room might be struggling in terms of how to make it, uh, make the art, how to um, cordon off parts of her heart and her brain from the outside world, how not to go crazy doing that. And she had this great line, and I want to put it to you. Um, she said that she was going to go into a new novel, and I, I just got so excited about this line, and she said, it will be a time of great attack. Oh, wow. And I thought, ah, yeah. And I just, wanted to, I just wanted to put that to you, that what does that bring up for you, when the idea of starting a new novel, um, a time of great attack? Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, God, it, it is, it's exactly what you need. And um, I am finding, uh, I'm finding it hard to find that, like, Strength, but um, I, I feel it. I feel it growing. I'm kind of on the attack of the end. You know, the, I'm on the last bit of the novel, um, and I, I started this first draft in um, October, and so and I remember because I'd given up a novel that just wasn't working, and I had great steam for, and it got me through about a hundred pages. My attack, and then, and then you know it kind of petered out, petered out, and now I have to like. Reboot, and I think you know something like this is very, very important. Um, I, I, in in some ways, I can't really say why. I, I often think of creativity as as some sort of you know fluid in the brain or something, and sometimes it's 
it's there and you wake up with it and you have ideas and you're thinking about the thing you're working on and, and everything that you go through during the day, it's like, oh, I could use this. And then, oh, Cicero. Well, he could be a Cicero scholar, you know? Like anything that comes in, you're like, okay. And, um, and, then, and then sometimes that, that fluid is just not flowing. And, and I do find that like any kind of preoccupations or worries or, you know, that, that can really cut into the fluid. Um, but I think you have to, the attack is really, the t you know, cordoning off that time as we're always talking about and, and just understanding that, that no matter where you are in the book, you still have to be incredibly disciplined. And discipline never happens naturally. Like, I can have a great day, and I'll think, oh, you know, I don't have to tell myself to be disciplined tomorrow because look what happened today. And then, and then the day's gone. Like, you, you just, you know, it takes, it takes so, so much energy to attack. Yeah, what did it mean to you? All of, all of that, and um, it's, I find that writing is such a... Um, combination of the heart and the mind. So it's the ideas. So all of that, get, get to the desk, be disciplined, and then, oh wait, <laughs> this sort of amalgamation of emotional curiosity, right? And then um, weaving in some luc lucidity about the ideas themselves. And um, it really is, you have to have your full, it has to be a time of great attack. Yeah. It just really wor does work, doesn't it? Yeah. That phrase. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I think the thing that, and I don't know, you know, I imagine there may be writers in the audience and, or people who would like to try something out. And, and I do think, I mean, I say this a million times, and sorry if you've heard this, but the focusing on getting the critic out of the room, you know, I think the attack can be really undermined by the critical voice that tells you you can't write, you're not doing it right, that's a terrible sentence you know, bad imagery, you know, go downstairs and eat some more food, <laughs> you know, have lunch, even though you already had lunch. <laughs> you know, like, I just, I do think um, the critic is just, and, and the sooner you notice when the critic is intervening, the better chance you have of getting the critic out. Mm, such a good point. And, and I... I, whenever I teach, I just try to get my students aware of that voice so that you don't have to listen to it anymore. I always say, let's keep the critic in Newfoundland. I'm, for some reason, <laughs> I've been very big on Newfoundland. Just keep the critic in Newfoundland. Um, I've been on a sort of, bit of a self-imposed writing retreat, um, and Lily and I actually do a lot of writing retreats together where we go into places in the woods and such. But this time I stayed at home, and I would roam my home looking for more chocolate, looking for, should I have more tea? What should I have? And it, it was not quite right, I have to say. It was not good to be in my home having this retreat. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, but it was still very revelatory, I have to say. Oh, it's my turn. Oh, um, um, OK. I was going to ask you if your relationship with reading has changed over the years. And, and also, um, kind of along with that, um, what was your relationship like with reading as a child? And then go from mm. there. Mm. Um, We've never talked about this before. No, I know, that was a new question. Um, I lived in books. I lived in books. I grew up in the woods in Woolwich. Um, Fourth, I'm fourth generation mid-coast Maine, and um, I took a 40-minute bus ride to school, and I would listen, to, you know, I was just a storyteller in my head, and then I had this extraordinary sixth grade teacher, Brian Hatch, uh -huh. and he said after recess we, could have, we would have free writing time, and I could write anything I wanted every day for about an hour after recess. I mean, could it have gotten any better? Um, so I did, and I just, I wrote all these stories, and it was just, I just, um, and, and then he would read to us. Mm. He would read, I remember, he, he I remember he read, um, was it Cujo? <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
he did. He read Cujo to us. I think we were in sixth grade, and we were just like, our jaws were just, we were wrapped. We were wrapped. He, every day he would read. I mean, what a, he and I are still in touch. He knows how important he is to me. Mm. He was that person. Um, I read like a writer now. I mean, that's not surprising. I am always kind of, I'm, I'm always a little sad when I, I'm, I'm, I might be working with a, a graduate student or someone else who's doing a project and they don't read like a writer and I, I have to teach them how to sort of do it and I, once you do it, you can't really stop. Mm, describe what's reading like a writer. You, you uh, are reading for a certain musicality of the line and pace and um, structure and you, you're seeing behind the, 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 the curtain, right? You are absolutely seeing what Oz is doing behind the curtain, and you can't not look. But when it's done so well, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. But I was going to ask you, can you still lose yourself in a book? Like, even though you're so conscious of, yeah. of the... Yeah, I can. If it's, yeah. yeah, if it's good. Can you? Yes. I think there's a... Yeah, there, there can be a moment where I'm just, like, completely swept away. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, but I'm still... Never, like, I'm still, like, I am swept away because this, 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 you know? I know. Not always, but, but I, I, I am aware of that. But it's kind of in a great way. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Um, okay. So we talk a lot, Lily and I, about honesty. Radical honesty. I didn't even mean <laughs> to use that word. I mean, I, I actually didn't. Because it's what is called for in writing. And that's not just in memoir. I mean, I have written a very personal memoir, and I had to be very honest. But I have to be just as honest in my fiction. And um, I wanted to ask you a two-part question about um, how important is it to you, or was it? Maybe this has changed. But in the beginning, um, we would have these conversations about how autobiographical some of the work might be, and there was a fear and how honest can we be? And how can we push through that fear to be radically honest? So I wanted to ask you how you do that. Um, and if you, you welcome that vulnerability. If you know feeling vulnerable sometimes when you're writing might be a good sign. Mm -hmm. um, I wondered about that. Yeah, it's interesting because I recently uh, had this Zoom interview and the woman asked me, don't you feel so exposed, you know, when you, because I had said that writers and lovers, you know, I definitely pulled some of my own experiences um, to use in that book. And she said, don't you feel so exposed? Isn't it just an awful feeling to have a book come out and, you know, you've, you've said those things? <laughs> and I thought that was so interesting because I definitely feel exposed while I'm writing it just because I'm kind of exposing it to myself first. Like, there's a lot of things that I don't know about until they come up on the page. And so I see it, and I'm aware of it. And I, I don't know. I think the exposure kind of comes from, I don't know if people will understand it. Am I speaking a language that, that people will get? Am I talking about an emotion that other people have had before? Or will they think this character is just an absolute freak? That kind of thing. And, but when the book comes out and there are readers and they come up to me and they say, I had this experience too, or, you know, I can't believe you wrote about this. This was my, this is, you know, and it's just, it's incredibly empowering. Like it is the opposite of exposing. It just feels like um, it's connective and you have this community of people who have been through this. And um, I, I don't know, I, I, it's, it's, I don't know that people, when they are, I mean, I know that this is a big reason, the critic and people not wanting to write about people they know or like people, you know, people who are like people they know or their experiences they've had because they don't want to hurt anybody and they don't want to, you know, and I, and I think that they don't realize how truly empowering it is to take pieces, you know, whole pieces if you're writing a memoir or small pieces, um, and 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 work with that, and it just um, 
it can't really be a bad thing if you do it really honestly and you say your own truths, you know? Mm. Mm. How do you feel about it? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that it's really important to push through the fear, and I think that there are a lot of people who have a story kind of burning a hole in their pocket, but it's scary, so they don't write it. So they, they'll tell you they have a story they want to write. Um, and um, I always say, just write it, and then we'll worry about the rest later. Like, why, why, why not try it? And, and then um, there's always, always ways to, to, to make the story work and to protect what might need to be protected later. But um, it kind of really does get back to the, probably the intention a little bit around the title tonight is, you know when you're in the presence of honesty, it's very exciting, and it, it might be a little rarer these days, or, and, and sort of great attention. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just, it's, it, it is a little bit um, writer to reader, and this gets at another thing I was talking about with my friend the other night, it's that melding of consciousness. Suddenly you're having a consciousness melding while you're reading, and it's so exciting. Yeah. That's what's happening, right, to your readers. It's so exciting. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to ask you one question, and then I think maybe oh, we'll yeah. do a little reading. OK. Um, what, OK, you, was the sixth grade Brian Hatch writing, was that the first creative writing you'd ever done? What was the very first piece of creative writing that you can remember doing? Oh my God, Lily! You've never asked me this. <laughs> um, mm, I, 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 I don't. I mean, I can't imagine. No, I'm sure I wrote things before. Yeah. Um, I'm, I know I did. Um, yeah, I went through a very, very heavy song lyric phase. <laughs> oh right. <laughs> very heavy. Just writing the lyrics out right on pieces of paper, maybe putting them on the wall. Yeah, but other people's lyrics. Yeah, I literally think my 11th grade, no, my 10th grade English teacher at Morse High um, let me do like a whole project on the poetry of Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> and um, it was really awesome. Oh, that's it was really, really great. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. The poetry, yeah. Um, OK. OK. Um, all right. I'll read. Lily thought it would be a good idea if we did a little bit of reading. And so um, it challenged me to find a place in this novel that where reading is occurring in, in honor of our, of our night tonight, reading and writing. <laughs> um, so these are, this is a scene in a cabin on an island in Maine where the teenage boys are waiting for their father to return from a hospital where he, he's a fisherman and he's been in an accident. And they're reading. And um, I will say that I have two, two teenage boys, and that the boys in this novel are um, borrowed. But they're also very much amalgamations of my, my, my two. And um, that's something that, that we might end up talking about a little bit, too, is, is a, a way to kind of not, not bring the emotional the facts in necessarily, but all kinds of emotional truth to a, to a story. So, um, but I will say that in this exact passage that I'm reading, there is some, if one of my sons were here, he might be very, he, he would either cry or laugh. <laughs> um, so uh, the LeBron jersey is so big on him, it's like a dress. And I have to work hard not to smile at his skinny legs. This is uh, a boy, he's like, 15. He asks if I want to do A Reader, which is short for Archer Family Reading Hour, which he named three years ago. It's a way to say he'd like to read with me without having to say he'd like to read with me. A sweet leftover from when he was young that he hasn't let go of. I follow him back to my bedroom and take the left side of the bed near the door. Sam takes Kit's side near the window. That's his father. Talking is against the rules in A Reader. You just read. I've started a book about Robert Scott's doomed trip to the South Pole, written by a crew member who found Scott's dead body. Sam is reading The Hunger Games again. I think it's his third time, and he says he finds this story soothing, though what this says about his anxiety I almost don't want to know. <laughs> we made him wait until he was 12 before we gave it to him, and Kit read it first to see if it was okay. He reported that he saw no way we could keep it from him. 
It's hard to keep anything from Sam. He's always in our business. The best part was how he lit up when we finally said yes. Every few minutes now, he laughs at something in the book and takes some barbecue potato chips from the bag he's brought. Charlie comes in and lies down on top of us. He's the older brother. And we can't move. We stay like this for several minutes, sort of suffocating. Then Charlie starts reading the book with Sam, turning the pages for him. In profile, Charlie looks even more like his father, same square jaw and eyebrows so thick and dark you'd think they're pretend. How would you choose to die, Sam asks his brother, early in the war or would you walk into the woods and die later? Sam, I say, please. I'm feeling jumpy about Robert Scott's chances at the South Pole. His crew is exhausted. Mm -hmm. Do we really have to talk about death? The woods, Charlie says, ignoring me. I'd walk into the woods. Then he buries his head in my shoulder. I can't tell if this is an expression of spontaneous emotion or if his nose just itches. I don't care. I don't move. Charlie smells like toast and something sugary that must be new hair gel. <laughs> me too, Sam says. I'd choose to die in the woods. Charlie thinks it's crowded in the bed now, and he climbs out and stands at the window and looks at the ocean. It's like you and Dad are divorced or something, he says. He's been gone so long. It's not like that at all, I say, but my heartbeat ticks up because I can feel how big Kit's absence is. I close my book and tell the boys they can leave Maine when they grow up, but they can never go to the South Pole. It's too dangerous. I forbid <laughs> it. They both assure me that they won't travel to the South Pole. Sam goes so far as to say that he's reluctantly taking the South Pole off his bucket list. I know he doesn't have a bucket list. I stare out the window and I see Kit far at sea with no one to save him. He is someone who would go to the South Pole. He has never been afraid of the ocean. When this gets too scary to think about, I climb out of bed. Some of the potato chips spill on the sheet. Charlie slides back into the bed and laughs at how easy it is to trick me into giving up my spot in the bed. <laughs> no, that's nice. So great. Um, I'm just going to read this little interview scene, very short. Um, and the main character's name is Casey. And she's a mess, an absolute mess. She's trying to write her first novel. She's working in a restaurant. And she's miserable. And she finally gets fired. And she has, because she has so much anxiety, she's really not, not managing very well. And um, she has a lump under her arm. Um, and she can't see the oncologist for several months. And she has two boyfriends. Um, and she's very confused which one to choose. <laughs> so of course, what does she do? She interviews for a high school English teaching position. Um, and she you know, can barely get out of the car and get to the interview. And then she's met by one person. And then she's led in to meet with the head of school. Um, and so this is this scene. There's a receptionist at a desk in a small waiting area. She gets up and shows me in. Up close, Aisha isn't as severe. She saw, Aisha um, is the head of school, and she saw her at the beginning of the day. Uh, she smiles easily and takes off her shoes as soon as she sits it back down. She folds one leg under her. We're, we're in green wing chairs near the window. What is amusing you? Oh, I can't think of anything to say but the truth. I was just thinking about this book that has a wing chair in it. I touched the hard green wing by my head. Which book? Woodcutters by Thomas Bernhardt. German? Austrian. Most of it takes place in this wing chair in Vienna. The book takes place in a chair. The narrator has gone to what he calls an artistic dinner at the house of old friends who disillusioned him when he was younger. He hasn't seen them in 30 years, and he sits in this chair by the door and ruminates about them and their artistic dinners. There are no chapters or paragraphs. It's just his thoughts, which are punctuated by the phrase, as I sat in my wing chair. It's a refrain, as I sat in my wing chair, many times on a page. He's there because a mutual friend committed suicide, and they've just been to her funeral. And it's really a book about art and becoming an artist and all the way it ruins people, actually. How did it ruin her, the friend who committed suicide? 
I like the way she seems truly interested in this fictional world, as if it matters, as if she had all the time for it before she starts grilling me about my teaching background. According to the narrator, I said, she started out as an actress and a dancer, but she met a tapestry artist and married him and channeled all her dreams of artistic greatness and, greatness and international fame into him. He who would never have pursued it without her driving him on, and she succeeded. As he became more and more renowned, she became more and more miserable, and yet he was actually her work of art, so she kept having to work at it, and eventually she self-destructs. At least, that's what I think it's about as I sit in my wing chair. She has been smiling the whole time, which makes it hard to stop talking. And talking about characters and books is exciting and soothing to me at the same time. Have you always been such an enthusiastic reader? Not really. I liked reading, but I was picky about books. I think the enthusiasm came when I started writing. Then I, stu then I understood how hard it is to recreate in words what you see and feel in your head. That's what I love about Bernhard in the book. He manages to simulate consciousness. And it's contagious because while you're reading it, it rubs off on you and your mind starts working like that for a while. I love that. That reverberation for me is what is most important about literature, not themes or symbols or the rest of that crap they teach in high school. She laughs hard. Honestly, I forgot briefly why we were having this conversation. <laughs> How would you do it differently in your English class? I think about this. I would want kids to talk and write about how the book makes them feel, what it reminded them of, if it changed their thoughts about anything. I'd have them keep a journal, and I'd have them free write after they read each assignment. What did this make you think about? That's what I'd want to know. I think you could get some really original ideas that way, not the old regurgitated ones like man versus nature. Just shoot me if I ever assign anyone an essay about man versus nature. Questions like that are designed, to, are designed to pull you completely out of the story. Why would you want to pull kids out of the story? You want to push them further in so they can feel everything the author tried so hard to create for them. Like Cujo. <laughs> but they don't think there, but don't you think there are larger issues the author is trying to explore? Yes, but they shouldn't be given, the, they shouldn't be given primacy over or even separated from the experience of the story itself. An author is trying to give you an immersive adventure. I throw out my hands, and I think this startles her. She shifts away from me. The only trouble with your pedagogy is that our students have to sit for the SAT and the AP, and they would have to have some familiarity with those literary devices. I nod. Of course. It's over, I think, in my wing chair. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. That pretty much sums up everything I feel about reading yeah. and writing. <laughs> We're almost in wing chairs. Um, well, uh, this is a nice segue into a question I had for you that isn't about emotion exactly. Now that we know that emotion is the catalyst, um, how will you just take us through how you might actually conjure a scene in your head? Um, do you go only through emotional curiosity, or do you have sometimes um, a, a concretization of it? Do you see something? Mm. How do you build a scene? Oh, gosh. There's so many different kinds of scenes. Mm. I mean, a lot of time, I'm really thinking about dialogue. Yes. You know, so dialogue really, I mean, that scene, for example, you know, that was all about what they said to each other and very little about anything else. Um, and so a lot of times I like dialogue. I like reading dialogue. I like writing dialogue. So that's often dialogue driven. Um, there's often, like, when, when I write a novel, I sometimes make, like, this timeline and the timeline will just have, like, like, I remember so well with Euphoria, you know, she gives him her, or he gives her his dead brother's glasses. Like, just that gesture. That, like, that took 40 pages or something to, like, lead up to that. And it's such a small thing, but it was so big for me. It was such a, you know, her, her husband had knocked off her glasses when he was hitting her. 
And so for him to give her a new pair of glasses, they're like in Papua New Guinea, you know, in 1931, she wasn't going to get another pair. Um, I don't know, it was just such a, it was such an important small object, but, uh, but, but it carried huge things for her. I mean, she was, she had not had an act of kindness for so long, you know, and, and, uh, and so those glasses, you know, with their tag from the police station, you know, like they were complicated and they were big and it was a big deal for her to receive them. Mm. So oftentimes there's, there's some sort of, you know, moment I'm just barreling toward. Uh, it often, it really never has anything to do with like scene setting, like creating an atmosphere or, I mean, the atmosphere, I, I do it, um, but it's not what interests me. Like, I'm, there really are writers who will write about the weather for a page. Like, I cannot do that. <laughs> I try to get like two, you know, maybe two sentences out of that, but um, I'm just not, that, that's not really where I, where I live in, you know, kind of expository description. What about you? You knew it. I mean, you knew it was coming. That's too easy. What about you? Um, I had I'm another curious. question. I had another question for her, which okay. it's uncanny. Um, that was going to be about dialogue. So, I mean, that's uh, you went. You took us right to dialogue, and I just love dialogue too. I just love it, um, and I think it's exciting when people um, are talking. Yeah. People are talking, um, and then when they're talking honestly. So this latest novel, I've been working on it, it is a highly, highly dialogue-driven novel. Um, because then people get to have um, a full um, modulation of human emotion. I mean, that's what I love, is they can be happy and then they can be sad, because yeah. they're, these people right now, for me, are, are pretty much stuck in a car in the mountains of France. Um, and they are going to do some serious reckoning because they're stuck in the car together for a really long time. Um. But also dialogue, you know, yes, the honesty, but also the withholding and the, the way people hide themselves and things in, around the dialogue. And, and, you know, I love that. I love the tension that the dialogue can create um, because people are usually not straightforward right away, you know? It takes, it takes some unearthing, and that's really fun to play with. So fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask you, just for the possible writers or people who are thinking about writing something, um, about beginnings and mm. about um, you teach a lot. And I'm wondering, how do, you, how do you think of beginnings, and how do you if you, if you had somebody who came to you and said, I have this story, I feel it, it seems to be like coming out of me, but I don't know how to start, mm. you know, what do you say to them? Mm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a big believer that story runs on tension. Story runs on conflict. So how can we escalate it quickly? I mean, I am coming back to that line, Virginia Woolf line, a time of great attack. So you know when you enter into a novel that has got some velocity and it's exciting. Um, I don't think that it's important to get too hung up on beginnings because I think mm. beginnings change all the That's time. True. So I love to try some beginnings out and then, um, let me see, this beginning, I'm just curious, I forget what the opening line is, but I think this line, this was an early line. In fact, this is kind of wild to, to riff off of Liza's amazing introduction in which I forgot that I wrote that poem for Lily's wedding. This is a paragraph that I wrote. I was driving up to Wiscasset for some reason. It's late afternoon at the end of a long October when the Fleetwood Mac song comes on. And I, I remember I pulled over and I called you. Yeah. And I said, I think I got it. I think I got the opening. I think this is it, you know, and, and one of the boys is about to say something really snarky to his mom about Stevie Nicks. 
Um, because we have a joke in my family growing up that you cannot go a day in Maine without listening to a Fleetwood Mac song on the radio. <laughs> I dare you. <laughs> well, certain radio stations that we listen to. And so my, the kids in this novel are hearing a lot of Fleetwood Mac. And um, I called you, and I, I was excited. And it, was just, it wasn't like a big deal. I was like, yeah, maybe, but I think maybe. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do. And I'm trying, but I'm trying to remember, we had the novel just been growing inside you without, had, had, you, put, had, yeah. you, had you put anything to paper, or is that really the beginning? Like, no. Did that unlock it? See, that's really a great question. I bet I had other stuff, but I hadn't unlocked it until I got yeah. the o opening. But I, I, I got lucky in that respect, I think. Sometimes I've changed the opening of the current novel. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that, yeah. the book you're writing now. Three times, right? Three times. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then it's just um, a game of um, structure. It's like, um, it's, not, it's not architecture, is it? It's, it's something about building something that, I guess it's going through, it's a house, I guess. We have, we have talked about that yeah. a lot and getting stuck in the basement. Yeah. It's hard. No, shoved down into the basement. <laughs> I always say that writing a novel is like, you know, you walk up the path and you, you know, you, you go into this house, and oh, it's a lovely, you know, foyer, and it's a lovely room here, and I look at that kitchen, and then suddenly just somebody right from, comes up behind you and shoves you down in the basement. <laughs> for like, for, a long for so time. long. And the whole time you're just trying to crawl out of the basement. That's how I think of writing a novel. She'll, she'll, I'll, I'll call her and she'll be like, I'm still in the basement. Yeah. I'm still in the basement. And then we have this thing where we, we can't believe the plots that we have written. We just can't believe them that they have taken us to these dead ends. I'll be like, oh, how did this plot take me here? Um, and so uh, it's important to stay very hopeful in the beginning of a novel or a memoir that you could, you could lop it off and you could put that yeah. beginning later if you want and you could start at the end, or you could start in the middle, and you could circle back. There's all kinds of beautiful geometry for story, right? Um, yeah. And we also, we, we have an expression called going to the Amish. I was just going <laughs> to say that. <laughs> just my problem. Um, is that, you know, you take a turn, you're, you're going along with your plot, and everything seems to be going nicely, and then you think, oh, well, she, her car should break down with the Amish. And then you write 40 pages of her living with the Amish for several days. And then, and then somehow you realize, well, that's terrible. That is just, you know nothing about the Amish, and you have insulted them terribly, and you've insulted yourself and the book, and you have to get out. You just like backtrack as fast as you can, and you forget you've never written about the Amish, and you go on, and nobody is the wiser when they read the book. And so Susan recently went to the Amish. I, we go to the Amish now. I mean, with so much respect for the Amish, but I, we, if we, I will sometimes say I've, just, I've gone to the Amish. Um, yes, you never let me forget that. <laughs> I wasn't going to bring it up. I was not. But it's really good shorthand for a lot of trouble. Um, woo, woo. I did some time with the Amish recently. Yeah. We all do. Yeah. We all do. Yeah. Um, um, okay, I, we probably only have time yeah, for, a, and then we're going to do some questioning, questions? Okay. Um, all right, I'll ask you one more question. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask you um, to tell us about how you connect with the reader. Um, in, uh, do you hold the reader in your mind at all? That's such a good question. Hmm. All right, I'll just end there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so curious to know if you do. Um, I, I have a love-hate relationship with the like, um, imaginary reader because in some ways I get a little paralyzed when I think that, that, the read, that there are going to be people possibly, possibly reading this, but then I get really excited about it and I go back and forth and and block the reader out and then think, well, I don't know if the reader is going to understand this. And, um, but I often say that um, I have a reader that I write for, and that is Lisa Adams, who lives across the street from me. <laughs> she is the reader I write for. She's not a writer. Mm. Um, she's trained as a lawyer. She has my exact taste in literature. Mm. And we always, always love the same things. 
And if there's any reader I have in mind, it's her. It's like, is she going to get this? Is she going to know what I'm talking about? Like, you know, I'm, I'm kind of thinking a little, a little bit of, and she, I always, you know, she's the, when my galleys come in, she's the first one to, to get a galley. And then I live in fear until she finishes <laughs> it. Um, yeah, but I do want to know the answer to this. What do you think about the reader? Um, the reader. Well, do you, but do you feel like you're trying to connect across the chasm to the reader? Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. But I, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yes, it's 100% it's, it's an, an, an act of, of communication and expression, and I very much want there to be someone on the other right. side of it. I just can't picture them. <laughs> right, right, right. I mean, I think that word generosity comes up, and, it, and we use that sometimes in writing, right? That if you are generous in the truest sense of the word, if you've given the reader enough to eat and drink and some yeah. good music and some humor, and then you can do the hard, because you can't just do hard, right. um, then they might, they might stay with you. They might connect. Right, right. I remember in the last... When, I don't know, you can, maybe can tell me, like, I read something about giving the reader pleasure, you know, yeah. and that was such an interesting, yeah. or, and also giving the characters pleasure. Yeah. Um, and I, I think it's when I was writing this, and it was just like, oh, kind of, you know, she was just one hard thing after the next, and then, and then mm. it was just so fun mm. to, to, to have some pleasure in there and really enjoy it, you know? Right. That's, I just think that's just so well said and so important. I mean... I remember um, the Nigerian-American writer and photographer Teju Cole, mm. who I love, had um, a great essay about being the narrator, because he writes very first-person auto-fictional novels, and um, he talked about that it was inherent upon the narrator to be an attentive and generous guide, that this was really inherent upon us. To, and he meant it in a way of like, like, here, come with me, reader. I'll take you on this journey, and you're going to see stuff that you'll enjoy. And um, I just, it, that's always worked for me um, yeah. to, you know, attentive, generous. Um, that's great. George Saunders has this saying that, or he says that the reader, for him, the reader is actually himself mm. at his most non judgmental, oh. at his most neutral. I don't know how he does it. But he gets into this very neutral place where he just reads it clear and sees if it, it it's working for him. I, I don't know how he does it, but wow, that's really I know. Interesting. I know. Yeah. I mean, when you're reading your drafts over and over again, you are there is a self that's involved. Like it's your trained reader self. Yeah. Apart from the writer. Yeah. There's a little bit of that. Yeah. Well, should we go on to questions? <laughs> Hello. Hi. We've been, you've been talking about writing and reading, and I'm wondering, in a typical work day, what's the ratio for you between writing and reading? Mm, that's such a good question. <laughs> <laughs> right now, I've been reading a lot, way too much. Um, at, you know, at the beginning, I, you, I try to just begin my day by writing my journal and getting to my work. And because of this, um, Kairos, I, I started reading the net after this one. I got so into it that my work days started becoming reading days. And now I have to pull myself back um, to the uh, to the work, but I I I mean ideally it's like sixty percent writing, forty percent reading. Mm, very good, <laughs> very clear. Um, thank you for the question. Um, and um, I read sometimes to, to start the work in the early morning. Um, it sounds rather obvious, but it's kind of like permission. You read, you feel permission, you feel, um, you don't feel alone, 
Writing is a very uh, solitary thing, as we all know. Um, and so uh, that gets back to being very careful about what you read. Because I want to be so inspired by what I'm reading that I literally have to throw it down to start writing, because it's so exciting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and poetry can do that. I mean, poetry can just, you know, blow your socks off, right? And, and we haven't talked a lot about language in here tonight, but I mean, that, the electricity of a good line, right? And a, a, a beautiful, beautiful distilled description. Sometimes that's all I need mm. to remember. Oh, ra it's radical. <laughs> oh, yeah. People do this, like words change lives. Stories change lives, right? Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Woman in the front. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'd like to talk about place. I'm trying to think how I can connect this to the reading and writing. So I'm going to say I've read Landslide, and Paris was the place. And I've read Euphoria and Writers and Lovers. And when I read Landslide, I got it at the Dairy Queen. I knew exactly uh -huh. where the location was. Paris was the place, I've only been to once, and I was fascinated by, you were ahead of the curve when you were talking about the asylum seekers and that very serious strain and the emotional aspect of being in a foreign city for these asylum seekers. Euphoria, far, far away, but writers and lovers, Boston, the restaurant, I could identify the restaurant, it was clear. So, I'm interested in the places that are far away. You're mentioning that you're uh, writing about being in Europe. And if I go back to Euphoria, do you have to be in the place? How do you create that place if it's far from where you live? It's not Woolwich or Bath <laughs> or Pittsburgh. It's not Boston or Southern Maine. So how do you get to the place? I don't think you went that far away for euphoria. I, I think I remember you saying that once. Yeah. So that's my question, to create the place. Yeah, for, with that, I did not go to Papua New Guinea. Um, and I tried to read about it, but I didn't find a whole lot of books really um, that, that described it for me in ways that I needed it described. So I really relied very heavily on my imagination. <laughs> I mean, I just, I just had to make it up and hope that the reader would, would go along with me. Um, it, was, it, was, it was daunting. Um, but they were kind of inside, they were, they were in huts, but inside they brought so much of their things, and so it was, you know, in the house, I, I mean, I could kind of imagine what that was like. Um, and it was really, I really like writing about places I've never been. I, I, I find it, um, I, it's just an act of pure imagination. And if you can make it feel real to yourself, it, it's incredibly satisfying. Mm, yeah. I mean, I do think people get um, inhibited about writing about place. I don't know why it, it doesn't inhibit me at all. I think you could, there's ways around it. You don't have to go to Papua New Guinea. I have lived in France, that is true, but not anywhere near where I'm writing about. Um, but I'm imagining it. Um, I did live in Paris when I, when I wrote about I mean, and you do hear that, say, that saying, write what you know, but I had lived in Paris in, in 1989, and I did set Paris was the place um, in 89, because it was just a very early time of the refugee crisis, and I thought it was very complicated for France. It was just really interesting, so I wanted to go back there, but I also I knew that time. Um, I think it's so exciting to, yeah, to write about new places. Um, and, you know, my, it's interesting that you're asking this because I'm realizing my character is very worried about getting lost and because she doesn't really know where they are either. So that's kind of cool because I hadn't realized it. It's why I'm, allowed, I'm allowing myself to do it. 
because we don't know where we're going. <laughs> mm. <laughs> and it's very steep, and we keep worrying we're going to drive off the road. So. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll go over here. <laughs> and then back there. Thank you very much. I'm wondering whether you can talk a little bit about the editing process and drafts, which you've both spoken about, and the importance of voice, and knowing a reader or having a vision in mind for that reader and what kind of feedback you get with whom or from whom you seek feedback, what relationships with editors you have, how that's developed perhaps as you've found your own voice and your expectations on how your books are received, et cetera. I did not hear all of that. Um, there was, it. okay, good. <laughs> um, so um, I'll start with feedback. So um, we have been in a writer's group for a long time. I mean, quite a long time. Has that been like 18 years or something? Or more? More. 20 something years. So um, other members of our writer's group are here tonight, who, who shall not be named. <laughs> um, and uh, they're my first readers. Um, and that's just an extremely valuable, wonderful exchange. And I just think it's very hard to write alone. You know, at a certain point, I think it's important to share. I do have a joke. I was talking with someone who was, had written a book, and they had um, given it to their partner, their spouse, as their first reader. And it hadn't gone that well. And I was like, uh -huh. never. Don't, that is not, we should have a rule. <laughs> Do that later. I mean, yeah. even if your partner is a writer or such, I just think it's, it's very hard to get what you want from someone that you have other needs met by and such. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It, I just don't advise that. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, I think the editor-writer relationship is, is you know, extraordinarily important. I have had the same editor at Knopf for all for 15 years, which suddenly we, and you've had the same editor for a very, and the dialogue is kind of extraordinary. And um, all I'll say about that to close is at Writers Group, I think it was last night at Writers Group, um, but now I might be hallucinating. <laughs> I'm even making this up. Recently, I was talking about, yeah, it was at Writers Group how I thought I'd, I'd ended the book. Like, I have always think my books are over, done. And then my editor will say, no, 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 no. Like, my memoir, I, she made me come back from China to Maine and have a reckoning with my family in Maine, in Portland. I didn't want to do that at all. She was like, of course we need to do that. We're not leaving the family in China. They, you know, they come back, and it was a really good idea. It stretched me. I had to do a lot of reckoning myself of coming home and um, facing some things that had happened in China. And then um, recently, like this novel, I thought it would be a great idea to just end it. The boys and their mom would go up to the hospital in Nova Scotia, and they would just take the father out of the hospital, and they'd just hit the road, just go on a road trip. My editor was like, that would never happen. They would, what are, where are they going? And, and don't they have school? And, you know, and so she made me, once again, come back to Maine. I had to come back to Maine. I had to go to the fishing village where they were from. They had to reckon. She makes me reckon. So, yeah. Uh, for me in endings, I've had the experience for, for two of my recent novels where I think I'm aiming to, for a certain tone, really, a certain mood, a certain where my character is going to land. And I land there, and I think that's the end for a little while, for maybe a couple of weeks or maybe longer. And then something else like happened with Euphoria. I thought his boat gets in, his mother is there, and then I was going to meet you for lunch one day, driving in from Yarmouth turning off on the Franklin Street exit. I think I had just texted, I don't know if I had texted or called and said I was gonna be late. And right when I took that turn, boom, I saw the last like three or four pages, the last chapter of that novel, which I really 
it would just not be the same novel without those four pages. Mm. And I just saw it all. And yeah. I don't know where it came from. I have no idea. I was stressed. I was going to be laid. I was turning. I don't know why that fluid was there and it just happened. And then with, um, with uh, Father of the Rain, it was before I got to the ending, but I thought I was just about to land at the ending. And then Obama was elected president. And that night, um, when he was elected, in the middle of the night, I woke up and I was like, <gasps> and I saw this whole like third part um, to the novel that I, that, that a little bit involved Obama, <laughs> weirdly. And, uh, and, and I, I was a little bit like, I was so happy and I felt like, if I get Obama, then she can have blankety blank. You know, <laughs> it was literally, it was like, let's just give everybody pleasure. Let's just, <laughs> I mean, you know. So, uh, and then, and then uh, I do give my husband, he is my first reader. <laughs> so, um, but he is not, you know, I remember when he read uh, Euphoria, it was on a plane and we, he, we were not seated, seated together. And we got off the plane, and he looked at me, and he was like, riveting. So pretty much like, all I want from my husband is the word riveting, yeah. and, then, yeah. and then I don't need any other feedback from him. Right. But that's what all husbands should be doing. <laughs> riveting. About everything, really. <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, last question, oh gosh. Well, I'll come with this. I'm sorry, this woman here with <laughs> Oh, hello. Um, you know, I never really thought about this until tonight, but I, I'm going to talk about the, as just being a reader. And for me, reading is a safe space. It's, it's a place of escapism, dealing with anxiety, a truly boring job. Um, and so this idea of just getting lost, you know, just getting lost in a story and, and needing that on a, on a daily basis. And it isn't something I would say as a reader that I've ever thought about it from the other side that you've been talking about, which is it, it is your work. And I'm 46 and that just clicked for me. Like, <laughs> this is a job for you? Um, because I always just sort of thought that, you know, wow, there are these magical people and they just get to come up with this stuff and who are they and what are their minds like they must be fascinating and 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 how much of the I guess writing process to you is is escapism for you mm -hmm. is it you being able to be in charge of this sort of fantasy world or fantasy story or and then how much of that is is work versus sort of escapism for you mm. wow that's a really interesting question to yeah. close out on <laughs> yeah. All right, I'll go. Okay. You go. You can close this out. And you can just say the word radical one more time. Um, there's no question that I, I think I was drawn to writing because I wanted some sort of control of my world, you know, when I was, when I was a kid, really, and, and particularly in high school when I started writing fiction. But I... I um, you know, there, there was just so much I wasn't able to control as a child, and, uh, and, and there was just chaos all around me, and, and I know that it was a place where I, could, where I could make things happen that weren't happening in my life, in, in all kinds of ways. And it was very, I think it was soothing, you know? <laughs> and, um, and it's still, I think there's still a draw in that way. I mean, I, I'm not a particularly controlling person, and I'm not, I don't feel like I'm a very controlling writer. Like, I don't, you know, I don't have a tight kind of outline, and it, it's not kind of locked in like that. It's, it, it's much more sort of intuitive. Um, but at the same time, I, I, I think it's a place that I can go where I feel safe. And um, even though it is, does feel kind of perilous at the same time, because you just don't know if you're, if, like how long you're going to be in the basement. But um, I, I, do, I do think there is very much a, an es 
an escapism um, but that also involves a kind of an unearthing and, a, and an interrogation of what's really happening in me and, and kind of connecting with that in a way that I can't connect to it in any other way. Mm. Um, I got lost in that. That was such a <laughs> thoughtful um, articulation. Um, I think we've been talking a lot lately about are we having fun writing? Are we, you know, is this fun? Yeah. <laughs> um, because if it's not a little bit fun, then it is work, to your great question. Um, but if it's too much work, it will often be flat. So how can you make it new, Ezra Pound? You know, how can you make it new? How can you get excited about language and um, be very curious about emotion and um, just keep, you know, you know, staying in there? Um, so it's a real mixture. I mean, I always say that um, with great irony to my grad students, I always say, writing is hard and it takes a lot of time. And they're supposed to say that over and over again with a, just a straight face. Because they're, they're astounded at how hard, at how long it takes. They're just astounded. And I'm like, yes, writing is hard. It takes a lot of time. Uh -huh. um, but I think that um, it has to have moments of great pleasure, too. And maybe that's part of why um, we, we want all that. We want the sensory, and we want joy, and we want delight on the page. Mm -hmm. And we, when our characters do something that makes us excited or laugh mm -hmm. or cry. Yeah. yeah, that's great. It's really exciting. Um, but it's, it's definitely a, a, a modulation, right? Always. Yeah. Yeah. And then that takes us full circle to, to that word. I mean, the discipline that is called upon mm -hmm. to get to the desk. Yeah. The radical discipline. <laughs> that it takes to get to the desk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I want to remind everyone that um, our two authors have happily agreed to sign their books for anyone who would like a signed book. They'll be back there. Um, we'll open these doors. And um, we hope many of you will make your way over. And for those of you who were unable to ask that last question, maybe you can sneak it in when you see them. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.